Support for this episode is provided by Circle, a platform built for the busy internal communicator. Circle saves you an average of 46 hours a month through drag and drop email that looks beautiful on all devices, real time actionable engagement metrics, and a variety of features built with the internal communications in mind. Visit circle.com, that's C E R K L.com, to discover how to elevate and simplify your internal communications. I'm Sarah Jackson. Welcome to Internal Comms Pro, the podcast. I'm on the road this season to talk to the experts that can help internal communicators face their biggest challenges. The time has come to raise the internal knowing of the value that lies within. It took me a while to be open to feedback. I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. But to listen to what the veterans tell you. And I think leaders are getting wiser and wiser to the fact that internal comms is something that needs to be invested in, that needs to be resourced, that has to have budget, that has to have a strategy. Do we have the right channels and mechanisms in place? Who are the right spokespeople? And just getting ahead of messaging and also trying to create new ways in which we can reach people that, that speak to that need for, for customization and personalization. So. I think it's part of just this overall shift in culture that is then aligned to the overall shift in how the function is viewed and the amount of influence that the function has as a whole. My name is Jimmy Carter and I'm running for president. Yes, that's President Jimmy Carter. He was the president that issued a proclamation on February 28, 1980, declaring the week of March 8th National Women's History Week. On that day, he said, too often the women were unsung and sometimes their contributions went unnoticed. Women unsung. There are so many, it's too bad history has forgotten names like Sybil Luddington, She was the 16-year-old girl that outrode Paul Revere by 28 miles to warn her father's militiamen of approaching British forces. We didn't hear about this because Paul Revere had a publicist, and, well, she didn't. And although Jimmy Carter is the lead story on Women's History Month, we don't hear about Teresa Serber, a Russian-born American labor activist, suffragist, and educator. She was the first woman to rise from factory work to leadership. She used every mode of communication, pamphlets, events, campaigns, tours, even writing her 1910 novel, The Diary of a Shirtwaist Striker. And she established an annual Women's Day, which was actually the precursor to International Women's Day. She spent her later years promoting adult education for women workers, and she was the one that inspired a California school district to create a Women's History Week. And that is the backstory behind Women's History Month, which didn't get approved by Congress until six years after the stroke of Jimmy Carter's pen. But it's these stories you don't always hear about. And what's fascinating is all these stories start with just one person the power of one person. Now I'm stealing an exercise from my late good friend, Mr. Rogers. Yep, we were pen pals. And in this moment, I want you to stop. Stop what you're doing and take just five seconds and think about one woman in your life who has made a profound impact on you. Go on, all mind the time. While history may never know her name, you know it, and you felt the impact of her worth on your life. Not one, but two women impacted me while I was on the road at the Advanced Learning Institute Conference in San Francisco. Although from two completely opposite ends of our country, these women had several common experiences and shared stories, all of which are getting told on today's show. My name is Michelle Lyons. I am Director of Global Communications at MetLife. I live in New York City. Hi everyone, I'm Maureen Thompson. I lead Employee Communications at Box, and we are 
are based on the peninsula in the San Francisco Bay Area. Well, I'm excited that you're going to take the time um, to, to be on today. We are doing a special feature for Women's History Month. So I've been wanting to do this for a long time, but this is our special Women in IC episode. So I wanted to, to just jump right in and really um, talk about Women in IC. And one, one of my first question is, first of all, how long have each of you been in the industry? So I've been in corporate for five years. Okay. It'll be five years in March. Uh, prior to that, I was in television. So I've okay. spent the majority of my career in television news as a writer and producer. Okay. And then after a while, I just got tired of that, the fires and the shootings. And I was like, <laughs> okay, enough of this. What else can I do? Uh, what else can I use my skill set um, for? And so stumbled upon corporate communications and uh, really enjoyed that. Okay, so that's how you got in it? Yes. And how long? What's your backstory? So I started in nonprofit, kind of a jack of all trades, marketing, comms, fundraising, and that parlayed into a corp com role with um, a corporate sponsor that uh, supported the nonprofit that I was working for at the time. Um, I got to roll out corporate social responsibility initiatives, do internal comms, and from there it just expanded into PR, social, and kind of all facets of internal comms. So okay. I How many I, years? Uh, she doesn't want to say. <laughs> I know. Uh, you started when you were 12. <laughs> you just say many, many years. Many, 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 years. Years. many years. So if you both could go back and tell yourself on day, your first day with your internal comms job, and you could go back to that to that young woman, um, well, we're still young women, but younger self, what would, what would you say to her now? I would say be open to feedback. So it took me a while to be open to feedback. I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. But to listen to what the veterans tell you. I had a, I didn't think it would be a big learning curve. I thought I'm basically doing the same thing in television here in corporate communications. I'm writing, I'm producing video. How hard could it be? But it's the politics and that was a big learning curve and so I would tell her to listen to what people are telling you. So yeah, I would just say to listen and be receptive to what people are telling you. I would tell myself, don't be afraid to make mistakes. I think the first couple of years of my career, I was just, you know, kind of a flower on the wall. I just wanted to watch what everyone else was doing. I was very much like looking for direction, which is obviously appropriate when you're early in career. But I was a little bit paralyzed as far as taking risks and, make, and speaking up and, you know, maybe coming up with an idea that I thought might be cool, but then keeping it to myself because I was afraid that it might fall flat. Um, you know, looking back on it now, it's like, what's the worst that can happen? And I think, you know, just reminding my early career self to ask yourself that question. What's the worst that could happen? Right. We are so afraid to, to fail. Yes. And we are wired. I think in our in these systems that we grow up in right that you don't want to question or you don't want to look stupid and so I think it's it's amazing that then it bleeds into right the career world so. but what you realize is that's how you learn mm -hmm. and that's how you grow by making so those true. mistakes but we don't know that when we're younger Since we're celebrating Women's History Month, we must hear from some of the greatest communicators of all time. One of my favorites, you know her, Eleanor Roosevelt. In her interview with Mike Wallace, she gave him the two things she thought the American people needed for growth. I just love these old historical clips. Good evening. Tonight my guest is a woman who has been called the first lady of the world. She is Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. You talk about the necessity for the American people to grow. I feel quite sure that what the American people lack is knowledge. I feel quite sure that 
the American people, if they have knowledge and leadership, can meet any crises just as well as they've met it over and over again in the past. I can remember the cries of horror when my husband said we had to have 50,000 airplanes in a given period, but we had them. And the, the difference was that the people were told what the reason was and why. And I have complete faith in the American people's ability if they know and if they have leadership. <clears throat> no one can move without some leadership. People can move with knowledge and leadership. I love that. I love her words as so many of them, even until this day, pack a powerful punch. Words have power. And it's with this sentiment that we jump back into my conversation with Maureen and Michelle. We'll tackle a term I'd quite frankly love to delete from the internal comms industry, the infamous redheaded stepchild syndrome. My question is, you get to talk to a lot of internal comms folks when you go to these conferences, and I've talked to literally hundreds of them. And one of the things I keep picking up on is they, they, there's a sentiment that internal communicators are the redheaded stepchild or they're subordinated. And my question is, do you feel that way or in your own role? Uh, based on my experience over the last 20 years, I think when you have a C-suite leader uh, for the comms function that has a, you know, a seat at the table with the other executives, you're far l less of a diminished function. I also think what I've seen over the last couple of years is just the evolution of the comms function as a whole, right? E even corporate America, the entrance of, you know, millennials and Gen X and Y and Z, it's very much, it's gone from a command and control type of environment and messaging from leadership to more an environment of choice. And I want a more customized, bespoke employee experience and I think leaders are getting wiser and wiser to the fact that internal comms is something that needs to be invested in, that needs to be resourced, that has to have budget, that has to have a strategy. It's not, you know, gone are the days of let's sit at the table and just take notes and write a memo or create a video for someone. It's what's the holistic approach, you know, do we have the right channels and mechanisms in place? Who are the right spokespeople? And just getting ahead of messaging and also trying to create new ways in which we can reach people that, that speak to that need for, for customization and personalization. So I think it's part of just this overall shift in culture that is then aligned to the overall shift in how the function is viewed and the amount of influence that the function has as a whole. I agree. I think back in the day, many, many years ago, it was probably perceived as the stepchild. Yep. But now it's become an important function within companies. And if you have a CEO who values communications, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing a lot more CEOs valuing communications, so it's not um, like a stepchild situation. I do feel that way. It's changing slightly because they're starting to see the value that we bring because we are coming up with fresh new types of content mm -hmm. and the types of content we're producing, people are, people like it mm -hmm. and they're requesting it. So it's like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe they do know what, what they're doing, right. yeah. <laughs> even though we know, we know, we know what we're doing. Yeah. So I would say, um, but it's taken some time. It has taken some time. Yeah. Yes. Like I said, I've been there for five years and maybe the last two years. I'm starting to see a shift. It's not where I want it to be, but it's getting there. But it's good news that we can say, collectively, can we say together, we're, it's, it was that way, it, it, you might feel that it, it might, you, there might be some semblance of that, but can we, I think as an industry, you know, and part of the podcast is to kind of raise the conversation and bring IC to the forefront. Can we stop saying we're the redheaded deception? Oh, right? I definitely think Can we now officially so, yes. say, we're done. That's not true anymore. It's officially over. We are now part of 
driving business yes. value. So that makes me really happy that we can, we're, you heard it first here, everyone. We can officially say we are not the redheaded stepchild anymore. So and I love internal happy. comms. I want to stay in internal comms and, and do more with a, of what I'm doing now. Um, so I would definitely say it's not the stepchild anymore. Yeah. It's valued. Yeah. I mean, we all know how powerful words are, right? That it's our job. It's mm -hmm. what we, it's, our, it's the currency we work in every day. And if we're, if that narrative is permeating the internal comms industry psyche, then people are going to internalize that and act that way. And I think, you know, part of it, the onus is on us to say, hey, it's not going to be that way anymore. But also, too, just looking, we are we're on the edge of this paradigm shift. And if we are feeling that way, asking ourselves why mm -hmm. and saying, what what do we own in, in that and what can we change about it? And a lot of it is the conversations we've been having today around building a data-driven organization and having the right champions who can you know, lobby on your behalf if you don't have the influence or the exposure mm -hmm. to do that to help elevate the function. Mm -hmm. Support for the Internal Comms Pro podcast is brought to you by Circle. Circle arms internal communicators with the messaging and measurement tools needed to increase your stats. Show the impact of your hard work to our C-suite with personalized dashboards and shareable reports. Learn how Circle can elevate internal communications in your organization by requesting a demo at circle.com. That's C-E-R-K-L dot com. Why is it, you were talking about they don't see the value, why is this an issue? Why is it so difficult for internal communicators to show their value? I think you guys it's hard to measure it. Would you, what do you think? Well, I think part of it is it costs money to have the right tools to get the data that is respected by leadership. Yep. So if you're working on a shoestring budget, you know, part of it is getting creative on how do you track your emails and, you know, what, what kind of suite can you bring? It's working with your IT team to say, what's our digital workplace productivity tool strategy? What role does internal comms play? You know, embedding yourself in more strategic business conversations where you can and also influencing where you can get data based on the tools that you have today. Because you may, we don't know what we don't know, right? A lot of times... Sometimes IT just, you know, keeps some things behind the curtain because they're not thinking like an internal communicator. Maybe they've turned off access to certain reports or, or data. Um, so I do, I do think that's part of why it's, it's hard to measure. Did you hear Maureen relentlessly digging here into IT, research, data? This is something I'm seeing with female leaders who are on the rise in this industry. Those who are aren't afraid of technology and they're not threatened by it and they view technology as a liberating factor to automate some of the mundane work we as internal communicators are tasked with. It's the same liberation Amelia Earhart was talking about with women in the home being the biggest beneficiaries of new science and technology that now were delivered to their doorstep. Their tactical candle dipping for light is now available with just the push of a button. This modern world of science and invention is of particular interest to women, for the lives of women have been more affected by its new horizons than those of any other group. Profound and stirring as have been accomplishments in the remoter fields of pure research, it is in the home that the applications of scientific achievement have perhaps been most far-reaching. And it is through changing conditions there that women have become the greatest beneficiaries in the modern scheme. Science has released them from much of the age-old drudgery connected with the process of living. Candle dipping, weaving, and crude methods of manufacturing necessities are things of the past for an increasing majority. Today, light, heat, and power may be obtained by pushing buttons, and cunningly manufactured and appealing products of all the world are available at the housewife's door. Here's a tip not only to women in IC, but all IC pros. IC pro leaders find the best tools to help them automate the things that are mundane. What are your candle dipping tasks? Doing an audit of those mundane tasks, which might be creating newsletters, scheduling meetings, sending out surveys, it all can be automated now with the push of a button. 
I see so many IC pros using wonderful tools now at their door, and all of this helps the IC pro get above the tactical to the holistic, which is what Maureen talks about in our next segment. I also think too, a lot of folks think, how hard can it be to be an internal mm-hmm. communicator? Yeah. I, I communicate internally every day with my family, with my boss, with my colleagues, you know, blah, blah, blah. Insert your example here. And so it's helping to also educate people about the, the nuances of the function and that, again, I keep going back to this, you know, the curve, the evolution of the function. Like, no longer are we note takers and we're going to write your memo, Miss CHRO. Like, let's build a holistic strategy. Let's look at all the people initiatives coming down the pipeline so we don't bombard our people managers in the beginning of the fiscal year and they get pissed at us. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, let's Mm -hmm. build out a strategic plan that drives the right behavior changes and... You know, it's looking at things like, you know, most everybody does an employee survey. Well, looking at the data, are you asking the right questions? Can you insert some internal comms questions in that, that then, you know, reinforce your business case? Sometimes it's just, it's getting creative to get access to the right data, especially if you don't have the budget for the tools Mm -hmm. that will give you that data. Well, you said something about working with IT. So (laughs) I want to go there because... Why is that a struggle? Is, is it, a, I mean, we're talking about women in IC. Is this a gender issue or is this just an issue with everyone? When folks say, I struggle to work with my IT department, why is this, why is this a struggle to, to have that relationship and to, to why, why is that another sentiment, I guess, that I hear? I was just going to say, I don't think it's a gender issue. I just think that's... Uh, a collaboration issue. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would, my personal experience, I have not had any terrible challenges working with IT. I think it's also where the rub comes in is we're measured on different things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So IT has different objectives. They're trying to, you know, increase workplace productivity by bringing in whatever it is, Slack, Zoom, Okta, all these things that impact the employee experience, but they're looking at it through IT lens and mm-hmm. metrics. So mm-hmm. are we, I don't know, increasing the, the our internal service rate and our uptime and our site availability and whatever those IT metrics are. Whereas internal comms, we're about, you know, are we making this easier for employees? Right. Are they able to receive the information more quickly? Or does it end up by putting this proliferation of tools in the system now we've created this environment of, holy hell, I mean, I got to Slack somebody and I got to email them mm-hmm. and maybe I should just text them because I'm not sure. You know, mm-hmm. it's just I, just making sure you're in lockstep with, with folks. You can have different measures, but it's also raising visibility, especially if you have a chief comms officer and a CIO to mm-hmm. say, hey, we see where there might be some conflicts of interest here and having somebody, whether it's one of those C-suites or your CEO saying, this metric trumps that, you know, are we, does this IT metric trump the employee experience or is it the other way around? Yeah, I agree. I think it's different objectives and that's where the breakdown happens. So yeah, I think it just comes down to different objectives. It's interesting. In my 20 years, I've sat in corporate communications. I've been a part of marketing and now in this role, I roll up to the CHRO. So I'm a part of human resources and to just see sort of the the difference in access in impact that you can have depending on where you sit in the in the organization you know in more in marketing i felt the closest to the customer actually um in hr i feel the closest to people leaders not necessarily the entire boxer population Mm -hmm. and then in corporate communications I felt the closest to our external stakeholder groups, so media, investor relations, um, community partners, that sort of thing. So as female leaders, what's been the most significant barrier you've faced? I think for me, it's, it's getting the right exposure and having the right level of influence 
um, I do have a lot of visibility to the CEO and interaction with the CEO and C-suite in my job today um, and in my last position as well. But prior to that, I think, you know, making sure that you have that access and visibility, depending on where you, you're at in the organization, can be really hard. And you need that, that exposure in order to progress in your career. So part of what helps give you that exposure is having a champion or a mentor um, in the organization who can, who can help pull you along. And I think sometimes you're just so bogged down in the, just getting your work done that any time to seek out a mentor or find those relationships, sometimes it can seem daunting or just, or, or you don't see anyone in the organization that you can relate to who has ascended to that level. So how <laughs> did you do that? How did you get access and visibility? So, so you say you have it now. Yes, yeah, so fortunately in previous companies, they were very dedicated to um, employee resource groups. So there was a very active women's um, resource group that had a really formal mentoring program. So I was able to engage and get sponsorship and championship through that and coaching, which was really, really helpful. Um, and then I was able to take that coaching relationship and extend it through my, you know, other job opportunities that I had after that and still maintain that coaching relationship with this individual who, um, Doe Kate, shout out to Lead Coaches. She's based in Denver. Um, just a phenomenal woman to have really help balance other, you know, workplace situations, conflict resolution, get someone's perspective outside of the business who's been at the VP level in another company. So that was, that was really helpful for me. On this day, we gather because we have chosen hope over fear, unity of purpose over conflict and discord. When President Obama first took office, the White House wasn't exactly the warmest place for female staffers. Faced with the disadvantage of being women in this heavily male world of politics, they found it extremely excruciatingly difficult to get their voices heard in a room full of men. So in his administration, here's a story you might not have heard, female staffers adopted a meeting strategy they called amplification. When a woman made a key point, other women would repeat it, giving credit to its author. And this forced the men in the room to recognize the contribution and denied them the chance to claim the idea as their own. And it worked. The woman that sparked this idea came up with the shine theory. Her name was Anne Friedman. And it essentially holds that when you meet a woman who's a badass, you should befriend her rather than view her as competition. Because the fact of the matter, just because she's standing in the sunlight, doesn't take anything away from the sun. We are all meant to shine. So let's jump back in as Michelle talks about the importance of such advocacy and both women give their shout out to their unsung woman hero. So what about you? So I don't have a traditional corporate background. And I think that has been a barrier at times. But fortunately, I was able to get a mentor, get an advocate who saw the value I bring. Because I think it's an asset that I don't have a corporate background because I'm coming in I don't know any of this stuff you guys are doing and I think that's a wonderful thing because we need to get away from that and more companies are getting away from it no offense but if you but if you've been doing it for so long if you've been in corporate for a long time it's hard to get rid of those spots yeah so again I think it's an asset but it has been a barrier in the past, but um, I have someone who really advocated for me and was able to tell the leaders, and then I was able to show through my work the value that I bring. So you, so that's key. So you both had an advocate. Yes, you, an, you need co- one. Okay. You, you need a mentor. Okay. Say you need a mentor and a sponsor. Um, I also think you need an advocate. You need someone who not necessarily is going to be your sponsor and get you to that next level, but someone who can make, you know, the other VP or the other SVP see the value that you bring to the organization. So is this a formal thing? No, it's not formal. So how, 
because I know in the Lean In book, she's like, don't go ask somebody to be your mentor. Right, no, right? that should be natural. Okay. The sponsor is about promotion. The sponsor is, okay, I'm a director now. Now I want to get to the VP level. Okay. Because then our organization is director, then it goes VP. And the sponsor, so when they're deciding who's going to be promoted, you're in a room, your sponsor is the one that say, Michelle Lyons, I think she should get this job. She's done X, Y, and Z. They're basically putting themselves on the line gotcha. for you okay. to get you promoted. Is this internal comms a, an industry where women can get promotions? Yeah, you can get promotions mm -hmm. okay. to the next level. Yeah. Okay. It depends on the organization. Totally. Too. Yeah. 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 Every company is different. Who inspires you and why? Who inspires me? I inspire myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the person who yeah. came to mind for me, uh, Sarah Granick, she's a former uh, manager of mine when I was at Granger. She... She's just so sharp. She knew the business, um, not just from a comms lens, but she could speak to our strategy and each of the different, audio, you know, what it was like to be in our branches and in our distribution centers and, you know, sit in HQ. Like, she just had a really great handle on the business and could explain it in such a clear, crisp way to anyone. But she also had great EQ. Um, she was so thoughtful and she was just egoless. Um, which is super rare, I think, to find in a manager. But she she practiced servant leadership. Um, I just, you know, when I saw that question, she was the first person to pop in my mind because I just aspire to be so much like her. I want to lead like her. I think I fall down every day in a lot of those aspects. But, you know, her example is one that I, I hope to emulate and I hope, you know, if I can have a smidge of the impact that she had on me, on somebody else, that would that would be amazing. Well, it's, it's how she made you feel, right? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. I right. think so. We, we feel like we gotta put on like our suits and be like badass boss bitch. Yes. And we forget that we don't have to get all suited up and, and be that way, mm -hmm. yeah. Totally, you could just be yourself. Well, another shout out then. What was her name? Sarah Granick. She Thank now, you, Sarah. She now Lots really of shout leads, outs. Yes. <laughs> leads uh, the comms function over at CDW mm -hmm. in Chicago. What about you? Oh, you're, you're it's yourself. Well, it's yeah, but, yourself. But, but after listening to you, I would say uh, Terry Hines, who is EVP of communications at um, Fox Sports. Okay. So I met her when I was transitioning from television to corporate, reached out to her, um, saw an article she did in... PSRA newsletter, reached out to her, didn't know her, asking if I could meet with her to ask her a couple of questions about corporate communications, and she said yes, and we met for coffee, and it's the same. She was very encouraging and told me, yes, you could, you could definitely transition. You have the skill set. Took the time to meet with me, and she's just a bad woman. She's just <laughs> fantastic. Um, her team loves her Aww. and she's smart and polished and put together and I always, I always say, if I ever had an opportunity to be on her team, wherever she is, I'm going. So I would say that, yeah, she inspires me. Okay. See the power of just one woman? Go Sarah and Terry. Two more names we now know. Women who are leaders in the IC industry can play such a profound impact as we're learning in today's episode. Did you know that our dear friend, Miss Eleanor Roosevelt, allowed only women into her press conferences, an idea suggested to her by female journalist Lorena Hickok? This saved the jobs of women journalists and ensured their access to news. Unless women reporters could find something new to write about, Eleanor Roosevelt recalled, the chances were that some of them would lose their jobs in a very short time, she said. Dorothy Dukas, Ruby Black, and Bess Furman are just a few more unsung names of the women who benefited from Eleanor's advocacy. Let's jump back in as we wrap up our conversation this time on the subject everyone struggles with, our health. 
By the way, the guy I reference doing the study on internal comms health is Mark Mohammed Poor, another name you might not know, but he's featured on this season's On the Road series, so you'll want to tune in for that one in a couple weeks. Okay, last question. So, again, I hear there's these teams and internal comms is so underwater. Um, we're getting ready again to do another episode all on health of internal communicators. Um, there is a guy that has done a study and the data is, it's disturbing. It's one of the most stressful um, industries, like right up there with surgeon. And so he's finding there's a lot of unhealthy people in internal communications. So that's a whole nother episode. But to that point, how, if it is, if the workload is as such, how do you balance that with your life and family? I do not struggle in this area. I am all about work-life balance. <laughs> all about it. Uh, <laughs> I, I go to the gym every day. I make time. I'm, I'm not canceling. I'm not staying late. I'm not missing my class. So I think you really need to take care of yourself because listen, in the end, you know, you're the one who's taking care of you and, you know, they can get rid of you at at, at any time, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have any problem with that. I think you just have to make a point to do it and um, and to leave the work at work and not take it home with you. I have no problem doing any of this stuff. <laughs> I love that you say that, because sometimes when you hear another female say it, like, then it's, it makes it okay. Like, I'm right, I don't have to do this. I don't have to, I can put myself first. Absolutely. I can't go work you out. You have to, you it's have okay. to. Yeah, totally. It's all about setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and do it early and in the beginning. So I have a 100 minute commute every day. And that's over, that's like almost four hours in the car, um, three days a week. I negotiated to work from home two days a week. I um, told my husband, you know, we need extra help with my two-year-old. We have a live-in au pair. You know, I think it's, it's asking for help when you need it. It's setting the right boundaries. Because if you don't, no one at work will respect them. They will walk all yep. over them. So... I mean, you set the tone, right? Are you going to wake up and check your phone first thing? Or are you going to go to the gym mm -hmm. and spend 30 minutes with your kid and, you know, have a coffee with your husband before you walk out the door? I mean, all things aside, everyone knows how to get a hold of you mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. if, if the house is on fire, they will find a way to reach you and let you know. But otherwise, the work is going to be there. And I think we just have to remind ourselves, like, no one took their dying breath and said, I wish I would have spent more time at work. Exactly. Yeah. And don't feel guilty about setting those boundaries. And, if, you know, like I said, I go to the gym. And if I don't go to the gym, I'm not going to be a good worker. Yes. Because that helps me de-stress. It's something that I love to do. So you definitely need that balance because you don't want to get to a point where you're resentful you're at work, you're angry, you're grumpy. Yeah. So it so you definitely need um, definitely need work life balance. Well, and I think it, you value yourself. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And that shows. And so then in turn and in the end, people will value you, mm -hmm. right? Cuz mm -hmm. they yes. see your value yeah. in yourself. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I go ahead. No, I was going to say it's on? not brain we're not doing performing brain surgery. Like right. you said the work will be there. Brain surgery? Here's two more names for you. The first women neurosurgeons were Diana Beck and Sofia Ionescu. Sofia was a Romanian neurosurgeon in October 1943, and she was an intern at Hospital No. 9 in Bucharest. In 1944, during the bombing of Bucharest, she was forced to perform an emergency brain surgery on an injured boy due to lack of sufficient medical staff. So we'll end this episode where we started. The one woman that had a profound impact on you, I challenge you to tell her, and it wouldn't hurt to give her a shout out publicly. The stories of these women need to be told and they need to be heard. 
because it's within these stories that we collectively rise and remind ourselves of the value that lies within. We hope our internal comms pro collective can help tell and share these stories of all IC pros. So stay tuned on our social channels and on our website as we will be kicking off our I See a Pro campaign. Yep, it's simple. We'll be sharing the great advancements of I See Pros everywhere. So tag a pro today, show them that we see them, we hear them, and we value them. And remember, we are internal communicators and we are no longer subordinate. We're no longer that redheaded stepchild. It is time to shine and to amplify one another. And I couldn't think of a better way to inspire you than to leave you with one more great name. It's one of the greatest female communicators of all time, Miss Maya Angelou. Of course, we all see a real pro in this lady. Lift up your faces. You have a piercing need for this bright morning dawning for you. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it into the palms of your hands. Mold it into the shape of your most private need. Sculpt it into the image of your most public self. Lift up your heart. Each new hour holds new chances for new beginnings. Internal Comms Pro Podcast is produced by Super Awesome Media. Our theme music is Hard Fought Victory by Purple Planet Music. Thank you for listening.